we've had a few people that can't make it today um and also it might be helpful for you to yeah be able to go back and have a look what other people have done um great so uh feel free to um switch your mics off um and if you do struggle with connectivity at any point switching your camera off will really help with that um and so then we can switch mics back on as and when you've got any questions uh, feel free to use the chat function for any questions say hello to each other um, please introduce yourself via the chat um, and tell us what you what brought you here today uh, what you'd really like to get out of the session um, I've got a couple of introductory slides if my computer plays ball Emma I think Florence has got a hand up did no, there was. Oh, OK, so that's um, introduced us to another good feature there, though, Florence. There is the opportunity to put your hand up um, at any point if you want to um, contribute verbally rather than through the chat. And that's just um, the little hand in the. So I'll put my hand up. So that's the little hand symbol on your toolbar in the middle there. So sorry, Emma. Carry on. Oh, no, that's cool. Um, and we'll do our best to try and keep an eye on that stuff um, mm -hmm. as and when we can. So, so welcome, welcome. Um, this is the first online um, Creative HE Jam and we're really excited um, about this uh, and hope that you'll be able to join us across the whole week. Um, next week, we are really short activities for you to join in at any point that you like um, from Monday to Thursday next week. And then there's an opportunity to join a live session again on Teams where we will explore what you've learned, figure out what we're going to do in the future. Um, and yeah, say, say have a good weekend probably as well. So uh, if I go to the next slide. Um, so if you've never come across the Creative HE community before, we're a kind of a group of pedagogic rebels, if you like. Um, so we're here to help support one another in developing um, and working on uh, ideas, creative ideas for education. So whether that's something that you want to try out that's brand new, or you want to talk through a, a problem that you might be that you might be facing. Um, or generally share resources that you think would be helpful for other creative educators. Then there's, so, there's a few ways that you can do that. So we've got um, a Facebook group that uh, you can actively post to. There's the ha creative HE hashtag that you can use on Twitter. Um, and uh, there's also the creative uh, HE blog and then uh, Norman might mention as well um, shortly around the creative academic magazine. So if you feel about if you feel like writing um, about your creative exploits as an educator, then feel free to contact us about um, posting in the blog or uh, via the magazine. That would be great. So anything I've missed there, Anna? I don't think so um we run the jam this is our second jam um we held our first jam face to face um in a different time in a different place um at manchester met uh near enough a year ago actually it was the 14th of june last year um and that was the first time that we brought people together kind of all at once and would sort of almost as a collision of creativity if you like um using a marketplace model to share practice and it was a lovely day it was a lovely event and um I have to say our, our Manchester Met team members did a fantastic job of hosting it and generating that creative space uh, so we do aim for this to be an annual event but we've had to adapt our practice creatively somewhat um to suit the current circumstances so the jam is an annual feature um, of Creative HE. It looks very different this year and hopefully it'll look different again next year. Fabulous and great to see you've still got your postcard from last year, Julia. That's fantastic. You will have something as well today that you'll create of your own that you can take away. 
Um, so to add to your postcard, that'd be fab. Um, so this is the, the plan for the session today. Um, we've got uh, four sessions before a break where we can have a little comfort break. Um, and something that I just want to point out here and I'll remind you at the time is what we need you to grab in that 10 minutes is a piece of paper and some pens of some kind yeah so colored pens or or um biros whatever you've got to hand uh, ideally either an a4 piece of paper perfect perfect mark love it uh, um, and either an a4 piece of paper or a square piece of paper okay uh, and then we've got another four uh, sessions after the break uh, and then hopefully we'll have some really good time for some discussion uh, before we go all go off and do our things for Friday afternoon. OK. Excellent. So it's over to the, the jam now. Um, OK, let me stop sharing my screen. Typically, my computer is just going really slow. <laughs> so it might take a second. Fabulous. OK, right. And you're back in the room. Norman, I believe that you're first up. Do you want to take control? I will try. It's the first time I've used it, so hopefully I can get my uh, slides up. Can you see my slides? It'll take a second. Right. No, not yet. If you click, have you clicked the share and then clicked on the yeah the relevant? I might have started though just before you gave me access. So I'll try. I'll try. I'll start again. Yeah, just try stop sharing and resharing might help. Yeah, usually works. Is anything happening now? I've got the screen in front of me. OK, are they the slides on your website? Yes, Norman. Yes, right. Because I um, I handily downloaded them. Good. Would you like me to take the con? Please do. Yes. I'm sorry. About <laughs> that, and while Emma is doing that, I just wanted to thank Emma and Anna and the rest of the team for putting this uh, little festival on. It's absolutely brilliant to uh, create this opportunity for us all to share ideas and experiences and practices. <clears throat> so hopefully this will work. With me. Just opening. These the ones? Can you uh, see that? No, they were last year. Oh, no. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, they, yeah, if you've got the link to my page, they're on the page at the very top of the Creative HG jam. Okie doke. I have. Um, I hope you're all chatting away while we sort this out in the background, guys. <laughs> uh, OK. Ah, slides. It's a PDF. That's why I missed it. There we go. All right, let's have a look. Right. Try again. And hopefully this will work now. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Emma. <clears throat> no. Okay. So I'll uh, I'll make a start then. 
Um, so what I'm going to talk about is a little profiling tool I'm developing. Uh, and the idea is that by using the profiling tool, I can um, try and understand my own creativity um, in, a, in, a, in a more a comprehensive way. Um, and uh, hopefully it will have, um, it, it can be used uh, more widely in education. That's the basic idea behind this. So the story starts back in early March before lockdown. I was on holiday with my wife. We went to Northwest Scotland. We visited Arran and Skye and the coastline between those two islands. And the weather was kind to us. It was a really nice holiday. Lots of time to relax and take in the wonderful scenery. And as we were driving around Alloran, I think it was the second day, um, sun was shining, we came across this beach and I just wanted to get out of the car and get on the beach and do something. I wasn't quite sure what I was gonna do. When I got down there, I eventually stacked some stones up and took some photographs and it gave me a lot of joy. It was, it was a really sort of uplifting experience. And as you can see from that first picture, it was a really stunning location. And after this, I thought, yeah, I, I, you know, I'm on holiday. I've got plenty of time. Uh, I will um, try and make a few more of these towers. Um, so over the next six days, I made a, a tower each day in different locations. I picked a location and I got a bit of geology in my background. I was a geologist originally, so I gave them some geological meaning. And during the holiday, I decided to put my photographs and videos together and make a little movie, only a few minutes long which I posted on YouTube for my family. So that's the first part of the story. Roll on to the next context, the April um, Creative HE Facebook forum discussion on creative self-expression. I wanted to use this as an illustration of how I had tried to create something which <clears throat> expressed how I felt about a particular situation. So I created a narrative, uh, that's three on the slide, and from this narrative then, I had, if you like, some, some knowledge of my experience. Um, I then began to sort of evaluate it, to reflect on it, and to try and draw out what was creative about it. So that was the start of the idea of a mapping tool, a mapping and profiling tool. And then shifting to the next context, which was the um, latest edition of Creative Academic Magazine that Emma mentioned, um, that magazine was all about creative self-expression. So I used this story and the tools there in the magazine. And now we come to this um, current context, which is this session. And I think what I'm trying to do here is almost reframe what I'm doing and, 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 and suggest that this tool could be used as an aid to reflection. Could I have the next slide, please, Emma? Okay, so I think Reflection is a very subjective process because it, in that reflective process, we're really grappling with a world that has meaning to us, trying to create new meaning and using our beliefs, our opinions, our knowledge, our understandings, our feelings and emotions, and all that comes into play. And I, 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 I sort of realized that because it is so subjective um, and really has only meaning to us, then by creating a profiling tool, maybe we are explaining what our subjectivity is, not only to ourselves, but to other people if they, if they want to see. So, so that I think underlies my thinking about this profiling tool. Um, so um, it's, it's, it's evolving uh, and it began, I think with only about four headers and now it's, it's, it's seven and maybe it will include a few more before too long. But the basic structure is something about the context and circumstances and affordances and mediums the sort of approaches and motivations to learning, doing, creating, um, an attempt to evaluate the creativity, and that is judged against my own norms and experiences. Um, fourthly, some sort of subjective evaluation of the context, and I'm using Kaufman and Baghetto's little c, pro c model there. Fifthly, um, a subjective evaluation of the purposes of my creativity. Now here I'm using Carly Lassig's model, uh, which is creative self-expression, um, um, uh, creativity for to achieve a task or a purpose, and creativity involved in trying to push the boundaries. And then six, the value and experience and outcomes to me, and seven, the audiences for my creativity. So that's, if you like, the framework I'm using. Could you have the next slide, please, Emma? Okay, so 
I've broken the, the tool into two parts for this presentation. And um, I'm only going to talk about this first part of my experience uh, around this tool, which was this wonderful experience of building towers on, 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 uh, in Northwest Scotland. So the first part then, the context and circumstances, here I was on holiday, lots of time. Um, that was you know, an unusual context in unusual places, inspired by the scenery and the light. Um, and um, and um, you know, wanting to do something in these particular contexts, these, um, these um, scenery contexts. The affordances are all round in the landscape and the materials, in the tools, in the mobile phone that I had my camera um, on, um, and in the software that I, that, that I use. The second header, estimated mix of context approaches, motivations. It's really very crude, but it's really to give me a picture, if you like, rather than precise measurements of these things. So between collaborative individual, formal and formal, um, directed, self-directed, for example. So for me, this was a very personal individual experience. It was informal and self-directed. It was emergent. It just came about because I happened to be in that place and got inspired by being there. The motivation was intrinsic um, and it was it, 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 interest and curiosity driven. Um, I think I wanted to achieve, once I'd built one tower, I wanted to build more. So there was a sort of process of wanting to make things in this, uh, on this holiday. Uh, I was definitely playing in this process. Um, it was very emotional in the sense that it gave me a lot of pleasure on the experience. The imagination, yeah, it was my idea. I have seen, obviously, towers before on beaches, but it was my, my idea in this context. And something I've done before, I haven't made the towers, but what I have done is made movies. So those, th those two came together there. Thirdly, then, the evaluation of creativity judge against my own northern experiences. I think the idea of making towers and locating and making them, photographing and videoing them, and then making the movie, really, it was, re it was at the little end of, of, of creativity. And if we go down a little bit further, we go into that little C, the little C of, of Kaufman and Baghetto's model, the everyday sort of creativity. So I'm not, I'm not sort of shouting out that this was a, a, an unbelievable act of creativity. It was a little thing that meant something to me. Emma, could I have the next one, please? And then um, the subjective evaluation of the purpose of my creativity, drawing on Carly Lassig's model. If you're not familiar with Carly Lassig's work, it's really, I think it's really important work for, for education. She looks at adolescence creativity and identified these three different, um, if you like, um, contexts within which creativity was um, undertaken. So for this particular um, journey for me, it was around creative personal expression. I felt something in that particular place. I wanted to make something. And so it was fundamentally around that, that sort of area. The value of the experience and outcomes to me, um, well, I think there was value in the artifacts. It was small. Um, the aesthetic value, I think, was quite great. As I said, I felt real pleasure in doing this. The affordance, though, of what I'd done, having made these towers and made the movie, was that it created opportunities to learn from that experience. And the transformational change occurred when I started digging into that and I began to understand that um, there, there was merit in developing these sorts of, of tools. And the audience for my creativity, it was essentially me and only me on that beach. Um, it's what I wanted to do and having done it, it gave me real pleasure. And then I shared what I'd done with my family via the little movie. So the, the audience then was, it was my family circle. Could have the um, next to last slide, please, Emma. And I haven't got time to, um, to go into detail, but the second element of this process was much more of a problem solving um, and boundary pushing element where I created the narrative and tried to make deeper sense of what of my experience through these new tools. And broadly, you can see the difference in the patterns between the two, the two parts of, of, of my experience. Um, and um, suddenly I've run out of time. Could you go to the last slide, please, Emma? So, uh, as I said earlier, I think reflection is a subjective process. By creating a profiling tool, it's, uh, 
it's a synthesis. It's it's um, if you like a a a learning process in its own right, and then using the tool, you can interrogate your own experience and challenge your own assumptions that are in in that in, in that tool. So it, it's I think it has wider application as a tool to aid reflection, uh, and I will end there. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks, Norman. Any questions for Norman? Feel free to unmic or, or write them in the um, chat. We've got time for a couple of questions and then we'll move on to the next example. Hello, everybody. Can I ask a question? It's Chrissy here. Hi, Chrissy. Hi, Norman. As always, very interesting and fascinating and uh, helping us think into new direction. I'm just wondering, because there's a lot of discussion around the usefulness or not of measuring creativity. I mean, I can see the usefulness of this tool for evaluating our own creativity and as a reflective tool, like you say, but why do we need to measure it? I don't think it's about, yeah. it's, it's not measuring it. I don't think, I'm, I'm not calling this a measuring instrument. I'm. I'm, it's really learning. It's a way of digging into our own experiences. We can create a profiling tool about anything, but create, in this case, it's obviously creativity. It's about a way, I think, of synthesizing the way I see creativity and then, if you like, uh, testing my assumptions on experiences. So here, here are a set of experiences that all linked together over three months. And I can look at different aspects of them and see whether my assumptions about creativity hold up, whether they, they are useful or not. So I wouldn't say it's about measuring. It's, it's more about trying to understand um, is the way I would put it. OK, thank you for explaining. I have a follow up question and I'm going to stop <laughs> because I always find your work fascinating. But OK, so it's it's looking back basically about uh, on the experience and, and how our creativity is influencing what we are doing. But about the future, do you also look into the future? Um, well, I mean, I know you know, Chrissy, but I, I sort of have um, an ecological view of creativity where stuff emerges as a result of your presence, your involvement and engagement in the environment. So, uh, yes, it goes on. But would I have been able to predict on that beach in Arran what has unfolded since then? Absolutely not. So, you know, the future is completely, is, is pretty open, I think, completely on, pretty open. And we just have to um, attend to what's happening and pay attention to that and respond and react to what's happening when it happens. So this lovely idea of watchful anticipation, if you do stuff, if you put yourself out there in an environment, then for sure things are going to happen. And really the job for us to do, the job for our consciousness, is to be aware of when things are happening and to you know, respond accordingly and hopefully creatively where it's demanded. Thank you, Dorban. Great. Thanks, Norman. Thanks, Chrissy, for the questions. Um, we're going to have to move swiftly on to Florence. Florence, are you ready? Uh, yes, yes, I'm ready. Can can I share my screen? You should be able to. So if you hover over and click, there's an arrow button. That's it. Brilliant. Yeah. I'll leave you to it. Fab. OK, thank you. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me to, to this creative jam. It's the first time I come and I think it looks absolutely wonderful. Um, well, wanted to talk to you, wanted to talk today about is something called Sway. So if you use um, Microsoft for your work or personally, you should have access to that. And why I started to get interested in it, it's just I was talking to my son, who's 18, first year um, the student SX. And I was talking to him about, um, you know, studying online. What's what do you find um, difficult? And his reaction was this: so many PowerPoints, so many boring PowerPoints. And I thought, okay, I'm an academic developer. I don't teach students anymore, but what could I do to help my colleagues do something other than PowerPoint? And I know this Prezi, but personally, Prezi makes me dizzy. I'm not very comfortable with it. So I just thought, OK, let's let's just try to find something else. And I came across Sway. Um, 
so for those of you who don't know what it is, it's what I would say it's a digital equivalent of an illustrated textbook. Uh, you can put text, you can put images, you can embed videos, you can also embed other um, Office 365 documents, so PowerPoint forms, um, Word, Excel, you can also embed audio. So rather than telling you what it is, it's best if I show you what it is. So I'll close this and, um, and share a sway so that you see what, what it looks like when it's live. So it's something I'm working on for my colleagues um, at UEA who need help about recording lectures and the back of my mind I've got my son saying how can I you know encourage colleagues to um, engage their students when they won't be able to see them particularly in lectures I don't know about you but you has decided there wouldn't be big lectures so there will be a lot of recorded lectures there will be a lot of webinars so what can we do to you know as, as academic developers to help colleagues so I just came up with what I would call them um, um, a small toolkit so what I like about Sway is that first of all you can have a contents list so I've put some, you know, some headings there um, and you can click on any of them. Uh, you can navigate sequentially, um, but it's a tool that allows you, that works well when you have a lot of images, good images. Um, you can, as I said, embed videos, so I won't play that, but um, so what I should do here on reflection is perhaps give readers, watchers some idea of how long the videos are, but uh, it's work in progress. And, Yes, I put some texts, I give more video advice, and you can scroll. And I just think it creates something that is a little bit more engaging than a PowerPoint. You can put more text, but reasonably so, without at the same time overwhelming people. Um, and okay, if I just show you a better presentation. There's different layouts you can use. You, quite constrained, but at the same time, I think that's quite a strength. You don't get too lost. Um, and you can embed you know, diagrams. Um, so I think I'll, I'll just stop here um, and stop sharing that because the rest is going to be more of the same. Um, so I just wonder what your reactions are to this. Do you think it's a good tool to engage students? Um, and if some of you are academic developers, is it a good tool to engage colleagues? Any thoughts? Hi, Florence. This is Hala speaking. Can I ask Hi. you a question? Uh, do we even need a presentation tool? Because we've actually seen, I mean, I understand there are certain manuals and information that we have to kind of like create, but, uh, you know, kind of like now that we've got the freedom to, to do, you know, kind of like something a lot more creative and based on what your son had said, do we actually need, you know, Sway or PowerPoint or Prezi or having, having you know, kind of, or, or just having a conversation or a recording or, you know, just an image, you know, kind of like might be enough. Um, so I'm just trying to move away from, any tools that sometimes I think we've all might have all been a bit guilty of hiding behind. That's that's a very good point. Um, I think we have to be mindful that students could have wall-to-wall -wall Teams meeting or webinars, and that's very tiring. I mean, suddenly talking to me and you know my son walking around the house said, "You're always online. You're always online." Um, and, you know, for the students having to have lots and lots of online events, um, I think perhaps what's behind there for me is trying to encourage to do students to do some flip learning. So, yes, you could say just read a PowerPoint, read a Word document, read a book chapter. So it's, it's more a case of sort of ringing the changes and bringing something that's perhaps more multimodal in terms of, of communication. Um, so I'm not saying it's the, the answer to everything. <laughs> uh, certainly there is a place for face-to-face -face for doing, you know, um, uh, let, let me share something else that yes, colleagues from a French university, and I thought that was, um, that was good fun what they were doing. So 
um, if I can find that. Uh, and um, while you find that one of the things that we've um, done is create um, standardised if you like, um, module information packs using Sway. So across a whole program, we've converted what was a Word document into a Sway with video welcomes from the head of school, um, little video overviews and, and, and hyperlinks out. So yeah. I think that that's worked really well for us in terms of um, using Sway uh, to provide that information in a more accessible way. Yeah, I think that that's what I like, that you can create really formal things with Articulate. Uh, you can create more, you can be very creative with PowerPoint. Um, um, but, and there are interesting things to do sort of face to face. I mean, now that I've created that, it's called the uh, shared this. Can you see the little people on the, on, Behaving. So the idea, the idea is that if you use that in a webinar, the student will circle or put a cross next to the little people to express their emotions. And um, so it, it can go wrong, but it can go well. So you just see where people are at. So that was just a silly thing. And I, and I like that sort of playful sort of dimension. So very simple things. So to go back to the colleague saying, do we have to provide uh, text? Uh, I'll stop showing that. Um, no, we don't have. I think it's just ringing the changes, and I was just offering that as a as an alternative. And I think it even with colleagues as well to create something that the, the feedback that I've had seem to uh, suggest people like you know just looking at something different really because we still have to read a lot of things. We're going to be online a lot, um, and we're going to get tired, and students are going to get tired. So just. Uh -huh. Absolutely. Find an alternative. Yeah, flexing that approach, I think, will be really helpful so that they, they, they receive things in different different formats so it's not the same every time. There's some really interesting comments there around co-creation and getting the and, and letting the students take control um, yeah, use this way. And I think that's a perfect example. Yeah, and, uh, absolutely. Students, I mean, assuming students have access to the Microsoft tools, uh, yeah. You know, could that be a format for assessment? Fortunately, it's not collaborative itself, um, but you can get a team of people working together to produce one. Um, that's that's a drawback that one person is in charge, um, but you, know, you can still contribute images and text together. Yeah, great. Thanks, Florence. Great okay. example. Uh, okay, we'll move swiftly on to Mark and Eddie. Hi, um, it'll just be myself. Uh, Eddie's having some technical issues, unfortunately. Um, but uh, if I can just share my screen. Can everyone see that? Yep. Just a note, Mark, when you're, you're playing a bit of video, aren't you? Yes. So if you yeah, if you want audio on that, just make sure that you tick the use system audio button when you share, because otherwise it won't play the audio. Uh, where is that button? So uh, when you click uh, share, so when you stop sharing this and then you share your video, uh -huh. um, it'll pop up. There's a little check box. Right. OK, if it's fairly obvious, so I'll, I'll be able to find it. Um, so. Hi everyone, um, thanks for, for having me today. Um, so uh, this is a, a talk about landscape architecture, uh, some of the work the students have been doing um, both during the term and um, on into the uh, the quarantine, the, the lockdown period. Um, so yeah, apologies, Eddie can't be here, but uh, our contact details are there um, if you'd like to contact us later on. Um, let's see. Um, so I'm a, a guest lecturer on the uh, MA course uh, and I've been co-delivering um, a hyper rural module this year. Um, so um, landscape architecture is preoccupied with the, the urban um, and the idea of this hyper rural module was to switch our attention back to the rural landscape uh, and really 
challenge students to explore a range of scenarios uh, that challenge the contemporary countryside, such as uh, climate change, uh, extreme instances of flooding, uh, ecological desertification, social fragmentation, uh, and and tourism. Um, so as a part of the uh, the unit that I was focusing on, it was um, called Immersive Environments. Uh, and this looked at the uh, exploration of the students' landscape proposals uh, with the use of extended reality, which is uh, an umbrella term for uh, virtual reality, augmented and mixed reality. Um, and it was uh, a collaboration that they worked on in conjunction with some game design students also from uh, MMU. So we started off by having a few different pitching sessions where um, we generated ideas quite quickly with the benefit of uh, a framework linking games uh, and and the landscape uh, and reusing that as um, an analogy to develop ideas quickly. Uh, by that stage, the landscape students had already developed uh, a set of landscape plans. You'll see on the uh, the bottom image there. Uh, and they were able to progress these into uh, 3D projects with uh, a range of software. Um, for the game students, they actually took a lot of the scenarios that the uh, landscape students had brought to light uh, and embedded it in uh, a game that they created on their own separate, um, separate course. Um, there is a video that you can look at uh, via this uh, QR code if you'd like to explore that further. But what it did was take a lot of the themes that the landscape students had spoken about in those sessions and use that as themes for within the game, uh, which were set within uh, a, a fictitious authority um, that looked at the different impacts of the proposals in terms of uh, the economy, the environment, uh, biodiversity, uh, and it's a fun little game and um, and they've done quite well uh, on their course as a result of that. Uh, but moving back to the landscape students themselves, um, so we wanted to uh, introduce to them um, the ability to uh, create 3D objects in, in virtual reality and not just be stuck uh, working pen to paper, creating 2D master plans that don't uh, you know, exhibit the extent of immersion that we wanted to. Um, so I brought in a couple of the uh, headsets that, that I have. Um, so it was a, a PSVR, a PlayStation headset, uh, a Samsung Odyssey Plus. Um, and we used uh, programs such as Google Tilt Brush uh, and Cool Painter VR for them to be able to experiment with creating 3D objects that could then be exported into uh, a 3D landscape plan. So it was a good intro for them. Um, some of the more conventional software that landscape architects tend to use, uh, things like AutoCAD and SketchUp, um, they're very good from that 2D perspective, but when you're able to throw VR into the mix, it adds uh, a whole new dimension. Uh, so you'll see from some of the screenshots on the bottom right, um, you're able to import a 2D master mm -hmm. plan in uh, and actually start to extrude the landscape, uh, add different features within there. Uh, and then actually play within that space, so you can actually walk around it in a you know a VR setup. Um, so it's far more uh, immersive, and the ability to interrogate design uh, is much more effective with those tools. So it's a real um, sort of step forward uh, in the way that we're trying to um, get landscape students to think about their their designs uh, and exhibit design as well. Um, so what I'll show you now uh, is a. Uh, a bit of a highlights reel of some of the work that the landscape students have been um, creating this year. Uh, it's not the complete set of works. Um, we will be having an end of year exhibition, uh, but I'll show you where we're at so far. Can't hear anything or see anything. Right. Okay. 
Do you, do you want me to Sorry. have a go at playing from my end? Yes, perhaps yeah. if you would. Thank you. Give me two secs to open the video up. Um, Try this. Okay, let's just give me the thumbs up, guys, if you can see that. Okay. Can you hear that? Can you see that? You. Can hear yeah. it, not, not see it. Yeah. Oh, right, okay. Not see yeah, it. Sound. We'll get there in the end. <laughs> so just as we're um, just as we're waiting, uh, is it going to go? Or? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Try this. Can you see that now? Yes. Yes. Can you hear it?
OK, um, I hope everyone enjoyed that. There are a few questions that have come through uh, since so I've started to try to uh, reply to some of those. So the students were, were master students, so they've already had some experience in in practice. They've used programs like AutoCAD uh, and SketchUp to start to create uh, 3D environments. Uh, but where SketchUp's really progressed is with the extensions that are now available uh, to be able to make more realistic renderings, um, but also to be able to explore the models in a VR environment uh, rather than just zoom in and out on a, a laptop screen. Um, so that's definitely a step forward in terms of how we can interrogate design and try and experience it from a human scale rather than just looking down at a master plan. Yeah, if there's any other questions, just um, just shout out and I'll, I'll see if I can see if I can answer. I think everybody's feeling fairly zen. If you if you like, that really <laughs> was found it really relaxing, almost wistful though, um, to see all those outside spaces. Yeah, if it was uh, a bit jumpy, I, I have added the YouTube link um, on there. Um, there's also the the QR code that'll provide the link to that from the presentation. Uh, and there's also a video online of the uh, the game design students work, um, which we wanted to get more of the landscape models into. Uh, but the problem was that the the two different courses didn't really align very well, uh, and that's something that we only sort of discovered a bit, you know, further into the, the the course. So, in that video from the game students, you'll see an elevated board with some grey models on there, uh, and there's some quite primitive uh, SketchUp models that the landscape students had created. But you can see how you could superimpose the colored 3D plans onto there to be able to explore within that uh, that, that game, which they created in uh, Unity, by the way. It wasn't within um, wasn't within SketchUp. Great. So yeah, if anybody's got any further questions for Mark, can I suggest we do that via the chat or via Twitter afterwards? Is that all right? Brilliant. Uh, Stevie. Do you and Janet want to take the con? Are you going to share from your end? Uh, I can have a go. We are, yeah. Can we all see it? That's the question. Yes, we yeah, can I see that. Perfect. Um, OK, so um, my name is Stephen Seymour and uh, I'm joined by my colleague Janet Garner. And we facilitate service use and care engagement um, at the University of Central Lancashire. And historically, that means that we recruit, train and support members of the public to share from their own experiences, um, uh, usually in the classroom as well. So obviously we were presented with a bit of a problem. So we're going to talk to you a little bit about our digital approach to public engagement and how kind of our practice has changed and um, we're going to make this wakelet available to you after this anyway and um, there's more information about our department and what we do here but I think Janet you're going to start us off aren't you about being creative <laughs> yeah and um, just before I start I'm just going to apologize because they may have started drilling again next door to me so uh, I may have to hand over to Stevie and um, okay. So as Stevie said, we co-facilitate um, service user and carer involvement in the classroom. But really, um, when I was reflecting on this idea of creativity during quarantine, I just wanted to reflect on the last three months and on our journey, you know, over that period. So I've seen a lot on Twitter and, and different blogs about actually comparing it to the seven stages of grief, the seven stages of lockdown, you know, that emotional roller coaster that we've all been on. So at the beginning of this journey, you know, we we're all hanging out in our cosy offices, drinking coffee and, and eating biscuits with our patient volunteers and and nipping in and out of classrooms. Um, and it was quite a lonely journey packing up and moving out and, and wondering what our patient volunteers were going to do for the next however many months, really. So um, during that period, um, we were very lucky in that we'd already created last summer a digital resource library. So we would captured people's stories on film um, and we would captured written case studies. So we had that library for our teaching staff to use if they wanted and to embed in Blackboard or or, what, or Moodle or whatever um, program they were using. So really we thought actually we could actually sit here and, and be furloughed I, I guess or and not see and wave goodbye to our volunteers for three months but I think once we'd all settled down and, and we'd got our 
got ourselves back together after a couple of weeks we we hit pragmatic mode and and started to get moving again and think well actually what can we do so we got our we got our service users onto um, Microsoft Teams. We started having um, social social meetings on there, but also conducting our teaching and learning sessions on there as well. And then we've become a little bit more creative as the weeks have gone on. So we are supported by a really dedicated team here at UCLan and our learning and information service. So. We've been able to um, utilize a lot of different software packages to kind of promote the service user and carer voice through that in things like Flipgrid, um, as I say, Microsoft Teams, Padlet as well, which we'll show you in a minute, um, and lots of other variations on that as well. So I think next slide, Steve. So, um... I think that what myself and Janet kind of did within the first week is we realised that we needed to have a, a very clear plan to be able to communicate to our public members, but also to staff that were coming to us like, ah, I've got all these sessions booked and obviously what do we do now? And so we came up with kind of three main approaches that we wanted to develop. Um, one a bit about utilising this re uh, resource library, um, which had pre-recorded videos, audio, written case studies, it looks a little bit like this to our staff members that can access it um but it's very two-dimensional the students can't interact with it. it is very much they receive information the second was like janet said about getting our volunteers set up onto um and engaging with microsoft teams but also things like adobe connect zoom and other pieces of software that different people um utilize and obviously due to gdpr and um the issues around confidentiality we um wanted to make sure that our volunteers had university accounts so that they didn't have to share their information with students or any of that so we went through the process of making sure they all got set up which um i think janet can share as well that it was it was it's been an interesting journey i think we've about 25 of our volunteers currently set up on uh, university accounts and there's nothing quite like explaining to somebody over the phone how to download <laughs> Microsoft team and sign in um, but it was it's been really exciting and then like Janet said we then started to look at developing new materials and utilizing things like Flipgrid, Padlet and those um, a number of our volunteers wanted to um, share their experiences and because we only had about 10 minutes today what we did is we created um, a Padlet that allowed them to interact and share with you some of their experiences of using some of this software. Um, so there's a little bit of um, introductions about me and Janet and how to contact us if you have any questions. But then we asked them to share their experience. And I think one of the ones I'll just quickly look at is this one. So um, this volunteer talks about um, when they were first asked to um, kind of do some of this, um, they, they thought they wouldn't be able to do it um because they only had a smartphone at home um but with the support and the patients that were given by myself and janet and lecturers they were able to not only get onto these things but really make positive contributions um and i think that's been like a common thread for our public members about um being quite anxious about technology and i think that's not even just our public members i think that's our staff that's us that's everybody <laughs> that's and it's been a, well, yeah yeah it's been a journey that we've all kind of adapted um so please obviously in your own time a little bit have a look at some of these examples as well i mean we we discussed the different kinds of things that we've used i mean we've got um, volunteers in doing admissions remotely we're using things like padlet like this um we created an external forum for our public organisations to interact and we've been running events all week this week about um, them sharing best practice with each other. I think one of our achievements is that, like Janet said, normally we're in a nice, comfortable um, coffee room and we're having conversations and we didn't want to lose that. So what we did is we created a virtual drop in every week that people could bring their cup of tea and just talk to each other. Um, Microsoft Teams allowed them to share. Um, we've got people sharing their baking recipes, their, how they're saying well. Um, some of our volunteers um, don't have access to IT, so we've been phoning them into meetings and keeping in contact over the phone. Um, but yeah, that's a little bit more information about what we're doing and some different examples for you to read. Um, and I think. So, yeah, so going forward, sorry, Steve. No, I was just going to say, obviously. Um, 
It's been a learning curve for everybody, obviously, over the past few months, and, and we just feel better equipped now going into the future. We don't know how many more months this will continue for us, and it's looking very likely that we won't be able to bring in vulnerable members of the community into campus for the next few months. So we're going to have to keep working in this way, um, but also recognising that we are we are still leaving a, a certain amount, a proportion of our patient service user population um, at home. So I think our next stage will be to try and empower them by um, trying to ask for some equipment to be loaned out to them so that more and more people can be um, engaging in this way. I think the side uh, thing that we found as well is that we've started to be able to engage with people that we wouldn't have been able to engage with with our historical model. So yeah. people that can't leave their own home or that live outside of our caption area where unfortunately we can't cover their travel expenses. Um, we've got some new volunteers from down south now and, and the aim is that even when we return that is how they will engage, they will engage remotely. So um, going forward I think we're going to attempt to do a blended approach utilising the best of what we have and especially interacting with our students on our other campuses um, nationally and internationally if need be as well in like Cyprus and West Lakes and, and where we have other campuses. So yeah, it's kind of a snapshot, I think. I don't know if anyone has any questions. So I'll stop sharing my screen. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, I think we've probably got time for maybe a quick question. Uh, we are running a little bit um, yeah. behind time, but if anyone's got something they quickly want to ask Stevie or Janet. Um, could I ask a question? <laughs> yes, of course you're here. Yeah. Um, uh, the the kind of drop in sessions is that something that you had face to face as well? So is it is it um, mm -hmm. echoing reality or is it it a new thing? No, they always happen quite naturally anyway. In terms of so when when people come in to take part in a teaching session, they would often arrive half an hour before and stay afterwards as well for a coffee and a chat. Um, and more recently, as we've gotten busier, um, people in the in the past would just tend to drop in at all the time anyway. So we've had more focused drop in sessions recently where they come in and they receive support and they just get to know each other a bit better. So we wanted to carry that on. And obviously we were quite concerned about our, some of our members anyway, in terms of keeping that social connections going, especially as a lot of them are shielding. So we wanted to make sure that they were one, that, that they were well that they were receiving their shopping even, you know, we, we we provide a lot of support for our volunteers, not as social workers, but just emotional support and just checking in on them that they're okay. So actually what we were trying to do as well is is take some of the burden off ourselves and, and try and promote, you know, the group well-being, looking after each other. Thank you very much, Janet and Stevie. I'm going to jump right in there while you're in full flow and I do apologise no because we've, we've started to run behind time a little bit. So rather than a 10 minute break, um, can I just suggest we have maybe five minutes to go and quickly uh, go to the toilet. I need to remove this cat that's uh, <laughs> looming in the background um, and we'll come back at five past one don't forget to grab paper and pens for our activity if you want to carry on with the discussion and i do hope you you will do so then uh, we've got a conversation going on twitter and we're also going to be facilitating a discussion on your teach as well um which chrissy and sandra uh, know a bit more about than i do um so perhaps they can provide some links in the chat Chrissy and Sandra, if that's OK. Um, but we are continuing the conversation on Twitter. And this, obviously, we want to extend the jam beyond just this little two hour space that we've got. So do use that opportunity to carry on and um, ask questions of Stevie and Janet and all the presenters. Um, just move the cat again. Um, so, yes, quick break, everyone, and we'll come back at five past for an activity.
Wow, that five minutes went really quickly. <laughs> so welcome back. Um, I hope you've managed to grab a piece of paper and some pens. Um, and fabulous, good stuff. Um, so what we're going to do together is uh, create a fortune teller. Um, so feel free if you want to turn your camera off um, then it will make if it, it depends how well you can see me um, and what I'll do is uh, attempt to try and walk you through it okay so this is experimental let's see how we go um, so if you've got an A4 piece of paper yeah you need to fold it like that um, and you'll have a little flappy bit at the bottom. You need to get rid of that flappy bit, either with scissors or tearing. Okay. You end up with a square piece of paper like this with a fold in it. Love your smile, Emma. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're all following Emma's instructions. Yeah. I've been doing nothing but cutting out constantly with my reception child for the last 12 weeks, but now I can't find any scissors. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you can fold if you use your nail to, to make the fold strong, then you should be able to just rip the paper. What did you say about a hole? So if you so if you fold where the where the paper was, let me find me where that was. If you fold it, then you should be able to rip it off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, sorry, a hole. Have you made a hole? I've not made a hole. Oh, no. Okay. Um, so then you should end up with a square piece of paper like that, and you want to fold it into two triangles, so you've got line folds across here. Yeah. OK, and then the next step is to fold the four corners into the middle. OK, I pre-folded mine in true Blue Peter style, so <laughs> give me a minute to, to do that. <laughs> Okay. Anyone here who's done um, the Associates Programme or uh, EH4100, the first module of our PG set, is now having flashbacks to origami, micro teachers, of which we have had many. Always very enjoyable. Absolutely. So you folded all those in, flip your square over so you've got the flat side and fold in from the corners again. OK. So you should end up with something that looks like this on one side and this on the other. Emma, I got lost. OK, so let me go back a step. OK, so you folded your corners in once. Yeah. yeah. Turn the paper over. OK. And fold in again. Right, I'll pop up now, thank you. <laughs> Oh yeah, great to get your kids involved. Perfect. Um, and then you can get your coloured pens out. So on the side that has the, the square flaps, you need to put four colours. You can just you can write the colours on. You don't need to use the um the actual coloured pens. Use what you've got round you. Yes, it's fortune teller. <laughs> So write your four colours on one side and then turn it over and write numbers one to eight on the other side. How are we getting on? Good, it's going well. Good, good stuff. Okay, so once you've got to that bit, 
and you've got your numbers and your colours. You need to open up where the numbers are. Excellent. Um, and you need, now need to think of eight questions. <laughs> That's the tough bit. <laughs> Okay, so feel free to use whatever questions you like. Feel free to only put a question in every other box. So now it's completely up to you. And um, once you've written your eight questions, then you then your fortune teller is complete. Emma, can you show me the numbers bit again? Of course. So on one side you've got your square yeah. flaps with the colours. Yep. And on the other side you've got like little triangular spaces. You Fabulous. want a number Thank in each of the triangular spaces. Thank you. Not use numbers, Neil. What have you used? Show us. <laughs> Just you to go off piste. Please. Hi, Emma. Um, sorry, got distracted there. What am I writing underneath the numbers? <laughs> <laughs> so on one side, you've got your colours. Yeah. Square. Mm. Flip it over. And yeah. the numbers one to eight on each of the little triangular pieces. All go off piste and spell a word if, or if you do, like Neil. Okay, <laughs> and that's as far as you've got. We're not writing underneath those triangles yet. So, <laughs> yeah, right, start writing your eight questions underneath. Oh, eight, so, eight questions. So, on under, the triangle, on the, on the box underneath the triangle. So, if I show you, flat yeah. one, two, pick that up. You want a question on this side and a question Brilliant. on this side. Thank yeah. you. Repeat four times. <laughs> Emma, will you show the questions bit again, please? Of course I will. <laughs> yeah. Um, so under your under your numbers, lift the flap, and under each side, you want a question. Got it. So at the end, you'll have eight questions. You can see my dreadful handwriting under there. <laughs> and then once you're done, you have to manage to, if you fold it in half like that, that's the easiest way. You put your fingers in the flaps, in the square bits behind the colours and you pull it together. And what you end up with is that. So Emma, sorry, is nope. it questions or statements that we're making? Uh, questions, because you're gonna you you're gonna use this fortune teller <laughs> and ask each other questions um, okay. either via the Twitter chat later or via the jam, um, or do design one to use with your children if you want to use one. So I've got one that I use with my son that's kind of make up a song hop on one leg five times so they're kind of challenges rather than questions completely up to you what you put underneath there okay, um, but I, I'm going to pick like... on somebody to play with my fortune teller in okay. a second okay cool <laughs> right done okay so what I want is a volunteer um if you volunteer in stick your video on <laughs> and audio <laughs> Stevie, yay. I'm okay, Stevie, so pick a colour. We've got red, blue, green or purple. Mm, I, live in, I live in Manchester, so I'm staying away from red and blue. Uh, purple. P-U-R-P-L-E. Can you see that? Pick a number. I'm trying to put this in front of the camera, it's hard. <laughs> um, I'm going to pick one. number one. Number one, so we go one. Now you need to pick a second number. Uh, I'm going to pick three. Three, okay. So your question, Stevie, is what does creativity mean to you? Nice, <laughs> easy question for you. <laughs> I thought we weren't quantifying creativity. I, I thought that's not what we were doing. Dye your hair. Dye's hair a different colour every weekend. Yeah, actually, I've done that during lockdown. Every single like, day has been a different colour. No, um, I think creativity is about doing something in a different way, I think, to me. Because 
while I might think is creative, like a wakelet in a wakelet, some of my colleagues might not think is that creative because they already know how to do it, but it's it's something different to me. And I think that's what kind of creativity is. Okay. Excellent, fabulous. Brilliant, Stevie. We'll have one more volunteer um, and then we'll move on. I'll do it. Who wants to volunteer? Me? Okie dokie. Red. So say that again. Red. Red. So R E D. Seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Can you see uh, that? Six. I can see a six. six. Is it six or is it? <laughs> is it six? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't read my own writing. Um, what questions do we need to ask the HE sector right oh. now? <laughs> <laughs> you pick probably the two most. Oh, what kind of hard questions are there? <laughs> questions. Oh my God. Yeah, how are you going to keep us all in a job next year? <laughs> <laughs> That's a question. Excellent. So, um, so yeah, my other questions were things like, if you were a superhero, what would your superpower be? Um, what's your favourite creative creative activity? Um, how are you responding to lockdown challenges creatively? Um, how are you looking after your well being during the lockdown? Um, describe creativity in five words or less. Um, and a couple of other questions. So I hope you enjoyed that silly little activity. Feel free to use it. Um, it was more of a test to see whether I could do this virtually as well, because I use it a lot in, in classroom situations. So you guys were really good guinea pigs. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Fab. So we are moving on to podcasting fantastic so jane julia and nikki do you want me to share the um the presentation or do you no i've got it here ready so hopefully I can share and I, and I only found out yesterday about the audio because i couldn't work out why my audio wasn't working by your team so that's one thing i've learned from this already Bear with me. Oh, I'm loading something else. That's it, Gina. Yeah, but I've not clicked the audio box. I didn't, you didn't <laughs> box, so I'll just try again. <laughs> Having just said that. It's just taking a little bit of time. I'll start again. Right, include system audio there if I tick that box. You should be able to see it soon. Can you see that now? Yeah, all good. <laughs> Lovely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. So, um, good afternoon and welcome to our short presentation about how we created a podcast. Julia, Nikki and I are lecturers in the children's nursing team here at UCLAN. And we have over 60 years collective, that sounds a lot, 60 years collective experience <laughs> in clinical practice as children's nurses. Um, our little journey begins back in March, like when so many others in higher education, uh, we were thrown into the unknown territory of online learning. 
As a small module team, we had to put our creative heads together and develop online content, which was not only stimulating for our students, but also had the flexibility and inclusivity to support asynchronous learning. Reflecting on some of our early feedback from our students, whilst they thought the online content was good, they said they missed being in class and hearing our experiences, which often allowed them to apply the theory to practice. One afternoon, the three of us were discussing a particular topic on Teams and trying to think of a creative way of presenting it to our students. My husband, who's also working from home, um, he works in media production, overheard our conversation and said, why don't you record yourselves discussing this and I will edit it into a podcast for you. And so the plan began. Julia. <laughs> so whilst we've come up with this um, idea or we've had this idea planted about creating a podcast, we do know there's um, ped pedagogical literature out there to support it, which is, um, I won't go into too much depth obviously in 10 minutes, but um, generally outlines how flexible and accessible podcasts are and um, how the human voice and that that, that narrative and um, the stories that storytelling kind of reflects um, that inspiring, engaging lecture and seminars that our students were missing. So practically, how did we do it? We decided to use Teams, which was really useful because we could see each other as we were talking and we could signal to each other to like raise a hand or stop or encourage each other with points that we were making if we thought they were good. Obviously, no rude gestures. We were very polite to each other. Um, and we also um, then took the audio of that. And, and as Jane said, her husband developed it into a podcast for us. So before we started, though, we did decide that we would have some kind of, um, we would have somebody leading the podcast to facilitate it, really to just keep it moving forward and making sure that um, there was a bit of structure, not too much structure because it did need to flow, but that there was some kind of focus to it. So we thought about um, having some questions prior to starting the podcast. So we formulated some questions and we all had sight of these. And that allowed us to kind of think of examples from clinical practice, which is, is what often brings um, the classroom alive in nursing. Um, so we thought of examples that we could use and also maybe link this to evidence to help our students out as well. So my initial concerns with the podcast were, would it would it last long enough? Um, would we go off on a tangent? Um, would it be really disjointed and, and awkward? Um, so I thought initially, if we get about 20 or 30 minutes, this would be really good and useful for the students. However, we started and after a few false starts from myself, an hour later, we were still talking and I brought the first podcast to a close. So I was know that those worries about not having enough material were a bit unfounded. And after editing, um, we all the buts, ers, ifs, you do become very conscious of, of, of what you say and how you present once you've done a podcast, realise we all have these little things that we all do. And um, we split, we had about 50 minutes material from the first podcast, so we split this into two sections just for ease of listening for our students in a kind of a natural break that had happened during the podcast. Um, and, and uploaded this to our virtual platform. However, um, I need no worries about the flow or the content either, um, or initially about it being disjointed because it did flow really well. And I think this happened probably for several reasons. I think Teams really helped because we could see each other, as I, as I said before. And also the questions and the topics allowed us to kind of naturally to, to have all that content ready in order to discuss it although obviously we did, it, they were just guidance initially um, and, and very often actually I didn't use the questions because the conversation did naturally just evolve and move through yeah. however I think one of the other things that really helped was that we do have quite a close working relationship um, and that we're, we're not just colleagues but friends so there was a kind of a good rapport and an ease of talking between all three of us and um, because we weren't obviously conscious or worried about uh, what others were saying um, and I think that really helped 
again, just to have this natural conversation throughout the podcast. And having said that, I'm going to hand over to my lovely colleague, Nikki. Hello, everybody. Um, so we just want to start by giving you a little soundbite of, of what the podcast sounded like. So I'll let Julia play that now. Hope this works. <laughs> Welcome to this second podcast for NU2377 and NU4378. We're really glad that you enjoyed the last one, hence we're doing another one. Today we're going to be talking about mental health. Okay, so that was a tiny little snippet into um, what the podcast sounded like. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about the feedback. Um, and as you can see from the comments on the screen, um, it went down really well. I think the students like the flexibility of a podcast. Um, they can listen to it on the go, in the car. I, I remember as a student listening to podcasts in the car, actually on the way to university, on a walk, in bed. Um, and they liked that they didn't have to sit at their computers. And I think we're all very um, aware, aren't we, at the moment of being slaves to our PCs. Um, they also liked the element um, of listening to our experiences. I know Jane and Julia both um, alluded to that in, in, in what they were saying. And I think that's because it gave them the feeling of being back in the classroom. Um, and I think that was an important feature of, of the podcast. Um, so as you uh, have just heard, we did two, we've done two podcasts so far. So the first one was just the three of us. But the second podcast that we did, we invited another member of the team in. And that was because of her experience um, in the topic that we were discussing. That then gave us the idea of having guest speakers going forward. Um, so obviously we are going to embed podcasts fingers crossed, into the curriculum as a permanent feature. Um, we just need to sort out the technical element, actually, Emma, um, which might be helpful. <laughs> and it might be where you come in. And I can see you smiling now because I've just sprung that on you. Um, so, yeah, that, that's um, a little bit about the feedback. feedback. It offers a fresh approach um, to learning, we think. Um, so we'd just like to know what you think now as well. Ah, oh, like that baby. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, baby. <laughs> oh, did you, is it Jenny? Jenny, do you have a question? Hang on, hang on. No, <laughs> Stevie, no. Stevie. Oh, Stevie. Stevie, Stevie, I just couldn't see the name then. Stevie, have you got a question? My hand is still up from when I volunteered, but I will happily ask a question. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> see, I'm just volunteering for everything, aren't I, clearly? But um, no, it sounds really, really good. And actually, um, I think you're absolutely right about that idea that when everything, everyone thought of delivering remotely, everyone thought, okay, it must be something that they can see or interact with. And actually, I really like listening to podcasts because you can literally have a lie down or lie on the sofa and just let it like wash over you. And I think sometimes I think we all need something that is a little bit different. Um, you talked about guest speakers, but just because we're at the same institution, would we ever consider possibly getting members of the public to engage with your podcast? And <laughs> personal experience? Yes, I like the nodding head syndrome. Yes. <laughs> um, well, I've like already posed that question on the chat, but I think... <laughs> And as you say, it's a great, it's a different way of engaging people. We've done it before in terms of um, having, you know, you must always have different guest speakers on modules and teaching and learning. So I think it's a great, you know, a nice different way, like you say, listening rather than watching or, you know, typing. So I think it, it lends itself really well to um, public engagement, doesn't it? Absolutely. And, and it incorporates different ways of learning as well, doesn't it? You know, I'm very much an audio learner. Um, so 
it, I mean, it's it's a really, really valuable thing, I think. And also it's a good medium for having discussions, you know, listening to people talking together. Um, do you have do you have shared discussions between you? Sorry if I missed that, or is it just one by one? Individual no shared shared discussions. Shared discussions. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah. Just as we would naturally probably be yeah. talking about uh, our experiences and, and bringing those in. And yeah, so, mm. so there was a little bit of structure with questions, but not much. We had four questions, that was it. Mm. <laughs> and very often didn't get to ask them because they just, it just moved on. Yeah, great. I think someone asked a question yeah. while we were talking about um, the editing. But I, I, did you answer that, Jane? I don't, I'm not. I can no, see. I, I actually don't know the answer to that because obviously my husband did it, and that's his job. Yeah. So I just, I just sent him the podcast and, and let him do the magic. Um, but like Nikki said, moving forward, obviously he has a full time job, so <laughs> so he tells. Me. So I can't, I can't really ask him to do these all the time for yeah. me. Um, so that's where we would need to explore this with Emma. <laughs> and I'm looking at Emma now on the screen um, at what the other alternatives are. Maybe there's apps and things like that that we can use. Um, a really, really good point. Actually, I think Chris has asked about deaf students and whether we've provided a transcript. And actually, the answer to that is no, we haven't. So that is definitely something and probably because we knew our students um, and we knew that that wouldn't be applicable to them. But certainly moving forward, we will absolutely do that. And on the bigger yeah. modules where we have yeah. hundreds yeah. of students that, that we would have to, obviously, that we don't know, we would have to provide that. So, yeah, very important point. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and asking which programme we use to record, we actually just recorded via Teams, but there are um, apps that you can use which will make the um, audio much, much better. We did try using that on the second one, um, and unfortunately I deleted mine, so we couldn't use it. But definitely next time we would use that because the audio was so much clearer. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. Yeah, so I am um, just to come in in terms of the, the potential platforms that you might use, something like Anchor FM might be something that you can got quickly get to grips with because you can quickly record and edit the audio and it'll host it there as well so you can embed directly into your VLE from there there's lots of other um kind of platforms available but Anchor FM seems to be the one of the most common ones if anybody else that's here knows about um any other platforms please do put them in the chat and we'll go we'll go explore them um, Fabulous. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Um, Thank you. OK, so swiftly on to Nayla. Nella, I'm not sure how to pronounce your name. Yeah, I see you, but I can't we can't hear you. Maybe okay. ah, I can hear you now. Great. Hello. Um, can I just check if you're seeing my PowerPoint at all or not? You are? OK, all right. I'll just run through. I don't know how to move from one slide to another, though. <laughs> so I'll... I'll um, can you see if, if I start with this? Can you see this? And then can you see me moving to the next one? Ah, bravo. OK. OK. So um, I would uh, like to share a little bit about the uh, project that has uh, happened um, just two months ago and it's still uh, happening. Um, it is a uh, um, kind of sudden um, transition to online learning that has uh, uh, produced it really. Um, I still don't know what to think about it. I have uh, so many kind of uh, reflections on uh, what just happened or what is uh, still happening and I would like to talk to you about that maybe more than a, a project itself because what it's unearthed is much more um, uh, important to me um, than uh, uh, the project. So 
I set it up as a uh, part of something that we have at the University of Arts. So all students can have a blog and that goes via this uh, particular channel called My Arts. And uh, My Arts then places it uh, with some kind of um, restrictions that is to do with GDPR, copyright and all kind of things. So I opened the blog uh, for the students um, of the second year of BA that I teach. And um, the option that I have taught uh, was called the exhibition studies. One of the reasons why, why it is so popular is because I take students around the galleries in London. I mean, who doesn't want to have that type of learning? And we ended up uh, losing that opportunity with the coronavirus. So I opened the blog trying to kind of generate um, not only the output from various galleries, museums, archives that we were visiting, but also uh, teach students what I didn't manage to even start uh, communicating to them, which is their assignment, and they had to create an exhibition proposal. So I had to somehow devise uh, um, this um, digital content that is then going to help them uh, produce uh, uh, the submission for uh, year two. Um, I created a blog uh, that uh, uh, I didn't put the link of at all. So it's called uh, Corona Defiance uh, Gallery. And uh, you can type in Google uh, if you like, and it should uh, come up. Let me just see if I can uh, copy and paste it in the chat so you can follow as I'm talking. Um, Bravo, thank you, Emma. Yeah, so it's there. So um, uh, the pages that I have created uh, were um, uh, about the project, a little bit about the exhibition, and then we go into the sections that uh, uh, I want to talk about a little bit more. Are you still following the PowerPoint? Because I can see myself on the screen, but I'm not sure that you are able to see a PowerPoint. Can somebody? Yeah, OK, thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, this is um, uh, the first thing that I would like to say about uh, one of the sections that is to do with uh, the exhibitions. And it is that some of the uh, museums and galleries have uh, long ago considered the situation uh, where people are away from uh, their site and they want to maybe um, explore their uh, archives uh, or uh, galleries or they want to prepare for coming uh, uh, to uh, the actual site. So uh, places like the Design Museum or v um, or British Museum or National Portrait Gallery have these um, uh, digital, uh, this, this digital presence already. And uh, it's not necessarily uh, uh, connected to the uh, current uh, exhibitions, but some work has been done prior to the coronavirus already. Uh, during the coronavirus, something else has happened, and of course, um, uh, it is uh, part of the VNA. VNA has this um, rapid collection. Rapid collection happens when the curators are sent out to the world. So, for example, I would imagine that they are kind of scouting around uh, Black Lives Matter movement, and they are picking up from the protests the artifacts that they feel are relevant um, uh, to be kept uh, in the uh, museum as a kind of sign of the times. And uh, coronavirus was one of those. Um, was is uh, one of those times and so they are collecting that at the moment as well. Uh, there have been other organizations that were reactive very much to the current situation like Royal Academy, MoMA uh, and uh, there are few galleries that created uh, online um, exhibitions. They're not very good, uh, like my blog is not very good, simply we had two months to devise something and it's not great. Uh, but it is out there as a kind of replacement of the fact that uh, one cannot uh, enter at this particular moment. So I have P. Angli. I worked with Rapid Response Collection for an MA. Such an inspiring idea. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so I'm going to talk uh, about that a little bit later on. 
Thank you for uh, uh, the comment. Um, so the blog had uh, the first thing set up, which was a video gallery. And video gallery came to me because a lot of friends and family, so totally private circle, started uh, sending me these videos, which were very much to do with kind of comedy. So when coronavirus has happened, we were uh, in kind of two minds. Uh, half of the people were very, very scared. And the other half was just having a lot of fun with uh, being creative uh, online and producing silly videos and we learned about this whole new platform that uh, actually existed uh, amongst young people it's just that we were not that um, conscious of it nor uh, bothered uh, and that was TikTok and now TikTok is uh, uh, in our adult life as well um, uh, this uh, uh, coronavirus uh, uh, lockdown has also been a creative outlet for many many people uh, and I have uh, used the blog uh, for that purpose. So a lot of my students uh, have been engaged um, uh, in producing uh, artworks uh, from masks to uh, all other things. Uh, and then uh, we have seen in the blog the presence of the support for uh, NHS campaigns uh, from clapping through um, rainbows and all sorts of flags. So we started incorporating that. That, uh, because I work in a design school at London College of Communication and it was important and then I started thinking about I have to communicate to these students not only the content but it is really important that I uh, explain to them that we are now going to have a different method of engagement which is this distance learning so one of the parts in the blog uh, is distance learning and my kind of uh, deliberations in relation to how is this tool working uh, for us now in this new um, uh, environment. And the last thing that uh, the blog has, it's a repository. So basically I created an archive that I can now draw on uh, and plan to. Uh, the blog also has this section called uh, resources for lockdown and they have been appearing the same as my blog uh, scarcely, but now there's so, so much of it. Um, so I called resources for lockdown communal assemblage simply because I at the end didn't know where am I even getting these things from. There was so much from um, Institute of Contemporary Arts to the SCAD uh, list arts admin, uh, arts newsletter, Tower Hamlets Council, uh, I, I live in that borough, has been uh, posting uh, resources uh, for from mental health being to the kind of creative um, uh, skills training. Um, Film London has been uh, broadcasting and Live Art Development Agency has been kind of uh, putting uh, out uh, a lot of resources that are to do with uh, staying and being creative in the in the lockdown, as well as what you do if your exhibition is cancelled and things like that. So uh, distance learning became something that I just got interested in by force. It's not something that I, you know, I'm not an education developer. I am overwhelmed with the work in the classroom and I absolutely love my students. Why would I have be thinking about distance learning when I have the world in front of my eyes? Teaching in London is just an absolute honor. Uh, and um, the first person that have kind of alerted me to the issues that uh, have uh, come from this distance learning and the fact that uh, I work far too much and that I need to watch out what it is that I'm uh, actually producing and how much hours do I work and all of this kind of um, uh, uh, reaction that the university had, even though, of course, we were uh, at the start of the lockdown suggesting that we do not teach online and we use this time for staff development, for the enhancement of the curriculum for talking to our students about all these things that we can't normally including mental health but that was a no-no the university was far too frightened that the, uh, they are going to withdraw their uh, fees the students are not going to be happy about it so we had to uh, make this online transition and I want that to stress that that this was not something that you know even though we spoke and I, I heard from a lot of you uh, today uh, um, uh, this change about something uh, positive it's in a way great because you know what else are we going to do then embrace it however um, um I, I want to focus on on, on the issues that uh, us who haven't been involved in the um, distance learning before are now uh, facing. 
I learned a lot uh, throughout this uh, two months period, uh, an enormous amount actually, uh, especially from Staff Education Development Association. I'm a senior fellow in Fine Education Academy and I have this uh, email list uh, that has been posting all sorts of things that uh, are to do with uh, virtual pedagogy. Um, I also learned a lot from a colleague of mine that has been absolutely amazing. Uh, he is our digital ambassador. Uh, so Mark Ingham is a reader uh, at UIL and he has been um, interested in these nomadic pe pedagogies long before uh, COVID. So he was kind of almost ready when it hit and, and it was really incredible um, to uh, follow what he was posting um, because it was critical as well as kind of um, uh, engaging uh, with the kind of positive side of all of this. Um, and of course, I ended up being in specialist uh, blogs or uh, experts and organizations. Uh, uh, blogs were a big thing. Uh, so, OK, thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, I see that I have one minute. Um, and of course, education articles in kind of broadsheet papers and all sorts of things. So. I have uh, already devised uh, uh, something that is um, uh, existent in UIL and it is a project London Calling that I wanted to do before uh, coronavirus struck. So um, London Calling is uh, a project that uh, I felt is needed. I um, am uh, one of the coordinators of contextual theoretical studies. So I'm in charge for theory in the second year and it is really, really important to me that students stay academically involved when they go to something that we call DPS year and DPS year is diploma in professional studies. They basically go to uh, one year out in the industry and uh, then they come back in the third year in order to complete their dissertation. Now that gap of one year can be really too much for some of them to come back to university and do 10,000 word dissertation. So within that year, I have been devising this project for London Calling in order to make sure that they have some kind of supervision, tutorial support um, online through this, uh, not necessarily distance learning, but distance support, um, something like that. Uh, and one of the things that uh, I have looking, I have been looking at for the purpose of that other project um, is uh, open university because people had uh, so many years of experience and I wanted to know uh, how is that done. I have uh, some knowledge through somebody that I knew that works for the open university of the fact that this is very much broadcasting and it's much bigger than just transition to online learning and we need to kind of take responsibility for how it is done. Um, I am aware that I have very little time, so I just want to say that there is a, a section on the blog called participation. I'm not going to go uh, too much into it. Um, uh, in my research life, I am a participatory scholar. I, I deal with uh, participatory art and design. And uh, I have made sure that my students are engaged through uh, making as well as um, uh, learning um, in relation to uh, the content of uh, the actual module that we had. Uh, I'm going to skip this because I don't have time and just come back to this as to kind of open a debate like what bothers me because this is a heart in a way uh, of, of my presentation um, that we have been uh, uh, expected to devise a research projects uh, amidst uh, teaching that has been uh, so research driven because I had to learn all of this in order to implement it in the first place. Um, this reactory way of kind of uh, uh, making uh, uh, research in the last two months is very much journalism and it is the way that many university managements uh, see uh, research in the first place. If it's not in the Guardian, what's the point of it and kind of thing. Um, projects that I have seen uh, developed throughout the coronavirus are very much uh, representations of this hyper productivity that drives me crazy. Uh, it's a kind of platform for self glorification or uh, assertion. Um, um, uh, there's a lot of conferences. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to start. There's a lot of I'm just conscious of time. So if you can make your final point, because yeah, otherwise. Yeah, yeah, it's here. That's the last slide. This is the last slide. Brilliant. So, yeah. So I'm also quite worried about the ethics of all of it because the relationship between me and students has been changed throughout this process. They think of me as social media and it's uh, my presence online as a social media. And it's, there's so many problems with that. 
Uh, and also our last uh, research grant has been converted to be teaching and learning grant uh, uh, in order to take away money from the research and implement this uh, online learning strategy that we uh, now expect to uh, commit to from September. That's it. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> I'm going to switch it off. OK, that's great. Thanks, Naila. And sorry to have to cut you short there. Yeah, thank you very much, Naila. So we've just got one uh, presentation left, which is uh, Sean and John. If you're ready to share your, um, yeah, your slides and presentation with us. Hi, Sean. Uh, um, uh, I'm John. Hello, everyone. Joining. That's John. I'll just see uh, if I can share my the right slide. I think that's that one. Can you see that? Yeah. Uh, yes. OK, and I'll try and put it in a presentation. Um, so just before you get day. started, I don't know if uh, this applies to anybody else here, but I know there is um, a, a webinar about the Include project at two o'clock um, that's being offered uh, via um, it's a Zoom meeting, I think. So if anyone does need to slip off because they're going to the Include webinar, that's absolutely fine. We'll continue recording and we'll be here till the end. Um, so don't worry about that and we won't cut you too short. Sean and John, if you need to be. Um... Well, hopefully we'll manage 10 minutes and then people yes. get to the next one as well. Exactly. I hope. Okay. Yeah. Thank okay. you very much. OK. Um, yeah, thanks for having us. It's really nice to be here. Um, our presentation is about the work that we do on our PG certs for in academic practice for members of staff in the University of Salford. John and I work on the first module together, which is learning and teaching in higher education and Lego up to March fig figured fairly highly in one part of that um, uh, module. Um, so we run uh, the module together and towards the end of it, we have a, a professional conversations for staff. This is something that we inherited um, from Christina Rancy, who put together the LTHG module at Salford quite a while ago. Um, and this is a, a part of the, the module that we've continued with uh, because it's worked really, really well. The professional conversations allow students to come and talk about their experiences and learning on the module. And at the start of that conversation, we ask them to make a model out of Lego um, about their learning journey, what they've learned and uh, or and or uh, a theory of learning that's been influential to them in the course of the module. So it's right at the end of the module. We give them quite a bit of time to think about it, prepare about it. But at the beginning of the conversation, they go into a separate room. There's a big, pile, a huge pile of Lego there and they put together their model and then come into the, the conversation. It's with myself or John and then quite often another member of staff from the university and have 30 minutes to talk through uh, about um, what they've learned across the course of the module. It's a, it's a kind of formative experience to help them with writing their portfolio. Um, the problem was this year that we were all in our separate houses and we didn't have Lego <laughs> and we didn't know that people would have Lego. <laughs> so we had to have a bit of a rethink as to what we would do about, about the Lego and about holding the conversations. So we... Um, Re reconfigured a bit. Do you want to say a bit about this, John? Well, because all our, our huge box of Lego was locked away in a cupboard in Salford and <clears throat> we were all at home, we basically tried to inspire people's creativity and we said, well, you, you won't have access to Lego necessarily, so just be creative. Think of um, Think of some ways of describing a theory of learning or your journey. But we thought we've got to do it first. You know, we've got to engage with the activity, not least to provide some examples. So, Sean, if you can put the the ones that we came up with. So, so we started playing around with this um, in our own homes using resources that we had to hand, and it was really great fun, actually. Um, so, I wonder if. Oh, we've given you the answers there. We should have done this as a quiz. Well, they're, not in the right, <laughs> they're not in the right order. It's just right. there's some of the possibilities. So you can see, I can't see the chat because um, of the way my screen is. But if people could put in the chat, which they think, A, is that constructive alignment, Brookfield's lenses, uh, or the filling a pail or lighting a fire, or B or C. Uh, if you're an academic developer, this is easy. If you're not, you may not find this <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> quite an easy task. Um, 
yeah but it was really nice to do wasn't it john to it not was. look around Great fun. I, I mean i think i've got a little bit of lego in my house still although most of my lego is in salford university now um it was nice to look around and see what other stuff we had and what we could do with it uh, I, I had a brilliant time with buttons. I discovered all of my button boxes and had a lovely time playing with buttons. Can anybody see the chat? I can't see the chat. I don't know what's happening in the chat. Oh, I can see it now. There we go. Um, yeah, OK, all right, OK. So yeah, you can you can work them out, I think. You can work out uh, that the middle one is uh, filling a pail or lighting a fire. Interestingly, if you take a photo of something on your mobile phone and then put it onto a slide, it reverts the order of it. So it, the, it should be the other way around. Um, so that B is that, and A is Brookfield's lenses, and C is the constructive alignment. So it was really, really nice. And what was really nice is we played around with that and, kept, and got got those examples. And then we had a, an information, it was, you know, we build it as an information session really with the students to say, you know, this is this is how we're changing the professional conversation. This is what you want to do. But it became a really nice guessing game of them, uh, you know, guessing what we'd made and where they come, came from. And they, it was lovely, wasn't it, John, that that interaction with them around the models. Oh, I think you might. Have. Yeah, it's frozen a bit, John. John. Uh, but we had a, we had a really nice we had a really really nice yeah, time. Yeah, froze for a moment there. <laughs> yeah, we had a really really nice time with them, and it was a really good coming back together again for the group. I think it we was. you know we hadn't we'd had this sort of big gap in teaching and and you know the emergency stop. And then that was the first time we'd all got back together in some sort of space together. And it was nice to do that um, play, you know, be playful with something, play around with something together. And, the, you know, we did it. We did it through the chat, but it was really nice. It was really funny. It was like one of it was one of my highlights actually doing that. So, um, yeah, so that's what we can did. I, say, can yeah. I just add in Chrissy said in the chat, it's not about the Lego and you're absolutely right. And I think because we got so used to using lego i think it had sort of just become part of the way we did it so opening up these different avenues and different ways of being creative i think was was really useful yeah 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 it was great so this is what some of the things that people came up with but you know we couldn't put them all in a presentation so i've just picked out some of them so some were about journeys and identity uh this one on the on the left was about somebody's boat. It was kind of like a boat of teaching. And she said it came, this is Yvonne Boyd. She said it was fine to use her name. And she would be here today, but she's very, very busy. Um, she had a boat of teaching. This was sort of like her identity as a teacher and things which kept her boat afloat and things which didn't keep her boat floating. So she said the money wasn't really, you know, she got paid, but it's not about that. This, the, the candle was about her students inspiring her and the things you get back from the students are things that really keep you going from the students uh, and I thought that was really nice and the spaceman was about her role as a fixer of things getting things and she said sometimes I still feel a bit at, out in space about some of that but you know she talked through all of these things and how they contributed to her role and her changing and developing role as a teacher uh, and it was it was lovely. It was lovely to hear that. And then this one with the stones was actually a photo, a, a piece of artwork from this. Again, Hannah, Hannah Kearsley, she said that's fine to use her name. It was a, a, a piece of artwork from her her living room. So as she was talking to me on Teams, I could see this picture on the wall <laughs> behind. Uh, and this was about her growing and she talked about how she changed. But you can see the line that goes through it. And she said, well, this is these are my values. <clears throat> this is what makes me the teacher that I am and this is my educational philosophy and the things that's, that are true through all of my teaching and all of my growth as a teacher and it was very moving to hear her talk about that it was lovely <coughs> excuse me uh, not Lego <coughs> but <laughs> and like, a bit like Lego um, maybe you can you might be able to guess this one if you're an education developer this is uh, Kolb's cycles, cycle of learning. And I remember her saying, look, I looked very carefully something that was concrete. So it's a, di <laughs> it's a digger, it's a digger with some concrete in it. <laughs> and uh, inspirational, inspiration of learning. 
uh, at the bottom there with a, a fit a light that was switched on. They switched on. She switched it on. Uh, I think that was Sarah. Yeah, Sarah Carlyle. She said. Uh, and this one was amazing in that it was double double loop learning. Can you see that? Double loop learning. And he gave a really nice talk about David Carlos and double loop learning and feedback. It was really, really, really great, really great. And this was a motive that came up quite a few times was teaching as baking. Um, ingredients coming together and starting off with one thing or many things and ending up with something magical, especially these ones here, these uh, cherry, cherry on the top of the cake uh, idea uh cakes here um also the idea of students coming to your classroom who are very different you know you're very very different things that come together and then what they get and how they access access the learning coming out of it so lots of different ingredients and then the ideas about deep and surface approaches to learning uh in different kind of cakes that came out so. They were, they were lovely. Right. And this, this is John's one to talk about because I can't remember. Yes, we can't. You can't really see that this is amazing. You can't really see all the detail, but we have this is photographs of boxes within boxes and their sort of clutter around them. And the student taught me through this amazing cycle of um, it's, it's about teacher identity and learning and student identity and learning as well, where um, you start off with a, what you think is a closed box, but then you open it up and see the chaos within. And then there are boxes within boxes. It was amazing to hear the student <laughs> describe this. She was talking particularly about, um, in the first instance, about COVID teaching in COVID-19 emergency situation. But through discussion, we then explored this as a more use, um, general way of, of viewing learning. And also the, the daisy chain surrounding the whole picture is about um, how all of this is wrapped up with um, mindset and how by adopting the correct mindset to learning can be improved. Amazingly complex model that the student just came up with oh, with sorry. stuff around the house. Amazing. Yeah, it's really nice. So there, there were many, many more very creative, really exciting ideas and you know i think we we could do quite a lot more about thinking about about them and and what they show but you know as a kind of conclusion um go back to the next slide yeah these are the things that we had a bit of a think about is but um certainly the crisis pushed us to do something different so that idea of yeah creativity is doing something differently absolutely we needed to do something different and i think for me, anyway, there was a real need to feel that I was being creative, particularly at that time, that early time of the lockdown, uh, to feel that I was doing something positive in response to the situation we were in. And I think I, you could feel that for quite a lot of our participants as well. So, you know, to, and to have a creative outlet felt really, really good thing to do, uh, to have. Yeah, Lego is not everything. And I think we'd got possibly a little bit fixed in our ways with Lego yeah. that we're like, you know, yes, we're doing Lego. It's brilliant. Everybody knows Lego is brilliant. That's what we're doing. Do Lego. Um, and I think to move away from the Lego really did allow people to do different things, think different things and and be very creative themselves. I think it was really, really important that we did it as well. And again, you know, we we put people in a room with a load of Lego and said, get on with it. But it's a really long time since I made a Lego model <laughs> of my learning. So it was it was a nice thing to do. And good point, Emma. It's not a digital activity. People are actually using, you know, concrete, uh, concrete artifacts, oh. which is important as well. I think I've lost my slide now. Oh, what did I do with my slide? Sorry. <laughs> I think you might have ended oh, yeah. this I've ended. Time. I've gone back. Yeah, I pushed. I I'm trying to go back and backwards and forwards between the chat. That's why. Uh, right. OK, there we are. So, yes, doing it, too, was really important and it was fun. I think that we had that demonstration. We had that bit of fun with it. It that brought more people in, I think. So sometimes with the Lego, we have to try quite hard to persuade people it'll even be OK to do it. And with this, people, I think, joined in and found it fun and got quite a lot out of it, you know, in that side that it was a, it was a nice playing thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. Baking, baking. God, so many people are doing baking. And I just think, where did you get the flour for that? When they were showing me all this stuff, <laughs> I, was, I was so jealous. We didn't have any flour at all. They had it all. 
they had it all. Um, but certainly, I think to think about thinking about the conversations as well, having that playful, fun thing at the beginning of those conversations. We, we'd always felt that that was what the Lego did for us and that, that helped to hand over the power in that conversation to people. But I think having a thing which was fun and we really didn't know what people were going to come up with in this situation. It could have been anything. It really started off those virtual Teams conversations, which could have been a bit difficult, could have been a bit more stilted, a bit, a bit harder to run. It really, really helped with that. OK, how's that for time? Brilliant. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Sean and John. I'm sure both Sean and John will be really happy to have conversations with you on Twitter yeah. or, um, or outside. And um, I know we're, we're a few minutes over, so feel free to disappear at this point but if it, likewise if you want to stick around and have a conversation um virtually face to face <laughs> now then you're very welcome to um final thoughts anna yeah sorry i've got um a small person doing gymnastics next to me at the moment so i'm <laughs> A little distracted and also a bit mindful of my background noise. Um, and I was just thinking about the flower. About the flower. Because, um, Emma and I had a conversation yesterday about this because I've been, um, I've accidentally had 12 kilos of bread flour delivered to me by a bakery. Um, I'm not quite sure what to do with it, but maybe I'll have some ideas now. Um, what, make bread? Yeah, make bread, yes. <laughs> Yeah, accidentally. Um, I ordered sugar, Chrissy, because it's my son's birthday on Sunday, so I'm making him a cake. And they sent me the sugar, but they've also sent me 12 kilos of bread flour that I didn't order. So, um, yes, Sean, I've got some plain, actually. Pizza. I think that that's it, Rochelle. I think we could get through 12 kilos of bread flour in pizza. Um, so maybe what we'll be looking for, I, I, it occurred to me actually, because I was also having a little conversation in the chat with Halle about making a vegan gluten-free cake as a metaphor for universal design for learning, which has been on my to-do list for a long time. And I've never actually gotten around to it. Um, perhaps the next time we're all able to be together physically, we should do food related teaching and learning strategies or discussing our creative approaches through the medium of food. Thank you. Hallie's going to send me a recipe. So that's a promise from me. The next time we can all get together, you can have my universal design cake. Oh, fabulous. Well, thanks, everyone. It's been a whirlwind um, and hopefully it's provided some uh, ideas for you to go away um, and work on over the next few weeks, months. Um, so don't forget, we've it doesn't finish now so this is the the first live section but next week each day from monday to thursday we're looking at a different topic um via a, a discussion and a, a creative challenge or little creative activity for you to get engaged with so please do play along with us um and discuss how creativity is looking for you now and in the future and we'll also send you a link to a live session uh, where we can all look at the future together and, and discuss what we've learned and share um, some of the examples we might have come up with during the next week. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone. Anna? Yes, so thank you so much, everyone. I think at one point we had nearly 60 people here, uh, which is just absolutely fantastic. Um, really, really. And similar numbers, actually, to the live jam last June which just goes to show that although it is we have been quarantined that um, actually our creativity is still flowing in all sorts of different directions um, Mark's asking are the live sessions going to be uploaded anywhere are we going to put them on the blog Emma yes yeah, so as blog. soon as I get the recording through I'll stick it up on the blog so hopefully by the end of the day it'll be the unedited version we may <laughs> chop up, may chop it up in a couple of pieces yeah. so that each presentation's um, kind of sectioned up. And for those people that were presenting, um, we may be in touch to say, do you want to write a blog post yes. to go alongside your recording? Yeah. Um, 
So yes, keep an eye out for the uh, asynchronous activities that are going to be running Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday. The conversation from this session will carry on via Twitter um, and you'll get another calendar appointment probably from me for the follow up live session next Friday. Um, sorry, excuse us. <laughs> And what else? What else was going to say? Uh, there'll be blog posts from each of the individual uh, curators Mama. of the shh, 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 give me a second of the asynchronous activities appearing on the blog through the week as well. So if you're not quite sure where to go or what you're looking for, go to the Creative HE blog, and we'll have instructions and information there every day. Fabulous! Well, thanks, everyone. Oh, well, thanks for posting the link to the blog, Chrissy. That's great.